behalf of CSU Chico, how about uh, we give a warm welcome to producer, DJ, and artist Toki Monster. <laughs> Like, you know, looking back, I probably was an artist my entire life, you know? 
Um, my love for music started very young. My love for even visual arts started very young, you know. And yet, you know, it's almost like not being in denial, but just not knowing that that was a reality. Like I could call myself an artist until I really started going for it, you know. And that being said, yeah, no, I don't really know how to answer this. <laughs> Sorry, I went on a tangent. Do you but. think you always knew you were an artist? Like, did you like always think? Um, do you always feel like I'm an artist? N now, now I do. Now I think I've always been one. But growing up, probably not. I probably thought of myself as a person who loved art, and not like I could consider myself an artist. Like, oh, me? I'm just like a normal person, and I scribble like on paper and sometimes little pieces of stuff and dabble on the piano. That doesn't make me an artist. But that's not true. If you guys do that, you guys are totally artists, you know? Um, but, you know, it's self-denial, it's like how I grew up and stuff, so, you know, if, if I grow up, if I have children, or if I have, like, nephews or family, or young, if I'm around younger people, I'll, of course, tell them that they're artists. So in any capacity, even if you don't do it full-time. So you were classically trained as a pianist, right? Yes, I did. <laughs> So, so my big question was, is how did you go from being, you know, classically trained as a, as a musician, as a pianist, mm -hmm. and then you wind up with a business degree at UC Irvine? Um, you know, being classically trained was more for, I think, just esteem. I, again, like for my, like for my mom, it was just a prerequisite. <coughs> you have to learn, know how to play some kind of classical instrument to just be like a classy person, you know. Um, <laughs> Like you, I mean, you guys know there has to be someone out here that's like you guys are forced to play the cello or like the violin, the <laughs> like piano. Like Everybody. I don't know, but you know, um, but your parents don't really want you to pursue that. You know, they just want you to know how to play it, just to have that culture instilled in you. So, yeah, I was made to take piano lessons. I didn't go like, oh, mom, I want piano lessons. I was six years old, and she's like, here, you're taking piano lessons for the next 10 years or whatever. Um, and I was like, okay, well, sure. Um, I, will, I will practice and we'll see where this goes. And I still had to take it for 10 years. And I love, I love piano, I love that I took it. I didn't appreciate it at the time, but it really built the foundation for me as a musician. And the reality is that's why those, that classical background never transitioned into music in that linear path. It's definitely like, that was just to keep me cultured, and then my mom never wanted me to really do that. She was like, okay, you're gonna go and be a doctor or whatever, you know? And so, um, you did business. Yeah, I mean, my mom was a businesswoman as well. I mean, like, a small business owner, but she did it all by herself, and I think she instilled a lot of that sort of um, innate sense, I think, that's involved, and that's the thing about business that's really important. You can't teach all facets of business to a person. You can learn like the textbook stuff, like how to like run your business in terms of numbers and um, maybe specific technical aspects of like business, but the reality is, you know, a lot of it has to come internally. A lot of it comes from sense, like business sense, I think, and um, you learn that kind of stuff just through experience or I mean, I think mostly experience, you know, but you learn how to fall, you know, dust yourself off and get up and try again and learn how to read other people and read situations and um, further yourself and your ambitions and that's, that's an important thing. But yeah, I went to school for, I went to college and I took economics and I really didn't like it <laughs> after a while. No, I really, I, I mean, not like not to like bash on econ. Um, I like um, I really did like it, but then but there at this point at which I was like, am I really going to go into that? And it was was it real? So I went more into international studies, so international business, and um, that definitely spoke to me more. And it was broader. That could have meant I could have went into um, I could have went into international business in more of a legal sense or whatever, but it just spoke to me more. But even at, in that way, you know, doing business in school, I didn't take that, assuming I'd be using it for music. It ended up helping me like completely randomly, you know. But you guys obviously know what you guys are doing, because from what I hear, you guys are doing business and music. 
on purpose. So that's, <laughs> I think that's the way to do it. Um, but yeah. So do you consider yourself an entrepreneur? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, definitely. I mean, me as an entity, me as Toki Monster, Toki Monster, Monster as an entity. I can't even say my own name. <laughs> okay. Toki Monster as an entity is a business, you know. Um, as an artist, I always try to remind myself or try to make a distinction because it's a business and I use it to survive and I do do it full time. But at the same time, there is this art that I create and I love and I think that if I start to focus too much on the business, I lose focus on the music. So, you know, it's definitely about being, um, I don't know, just um, looking at the business but not using, like having the business part take away your passion. You know, I've seen a lot of, a lot of people that use music to survive and they become so desperate because it's difficult and they begin to resent music when in actuality they resent the business part of it, you know, so that's something also that, that's one of the things I've come across. Yeah, I was gonna ask you about your name because that, I thought that was a really clever name too. Um, how did you come up with the name Toki Monster? Because it's very cool to say. <laughs> you know. It's kind of hard if you have a list. Um, <laughs> uh, Toki Monster is basically, well Toki means rabbit in Korean, and Monster was a way that I decided to write Monster. Um, so essentially my name was Rabbit Monster. Uh, I've seen you with the ears. Yeah, and that's sort of, that's like the Rabbit Monster as well. Um, but yeah, that, you know, I kind of like that sort of um, juxtaposition of this like cute and scary, uh, the the beautiful and the ugly and the evil and the kind, profound, whatever you know, like um, and how they work in harmony, like yin and yang. You need both in reality and in my music too. I think there's always this like sense of aggressiveness, like that sort of monstery aspect, and there's that um, ethereal, lighter. Nature to it as well, which is, I guess, the Toki part. But the reality is, it was just a chat name when I was in high school, so. <laughs> but it definitely grew to mean something, you know. A lot of artists put names arbitrarily in the beginning, which is in my case, but it actually grew to have a lot of meaning with me, and um, yeah, I'm really fortunate to have a name that I can Google and doesn't come up with anyone else, too, so <laughs> that's something to think about. Um, I was also curious about, well, you were in school studying business. Um, how did you wind up in the, the low-end theory scene? Did you jump in when you went to college, or was it earlier? Um, when I was in college, I guess I had some other, well, prior to low-end theory, there was something called Project Glowed, and um, that was in Lamarck Park, South LA, and it was sort of this like, precursor. Um, freestyle rappers would go there, you'd have, you know, um, break dancers go there, they would have producer nights. And um, from there, some of those guys started Low in Theory, and I had friends that had gone to Project Glow. Um, like, there's a guy named Dumbfounded, who's really known from Project Glow. It's just another sort of second generation Korean American dude, but he's a rapper. So he came from that scene as well. Um, we all moved to Low in Theory, which was more focused on a bit more experimental music, not just hip hop, more, um, like electronic, like left field electronic, left field hip hop, very unique sounding stuff. And yeah, that was it, just an introduction to someone else, but it's also because, you know, that was, I got introduced to Lone Dairy after I started making beats, and so I was like, I found a home. You know, this is where I want to be. These people get me, um, they understand the idea of instrumental hip hop beats, essentially, and um, yeah, it just sort of became my spot. A lot of people are about to Yeah, I was gonna say, um, who came out of that scene? Because it seems like a, a lot of people had success alongside you, like get a good crew. Yeah, um, out of Lone Theory came out Flying Lotus, probably most notably. Um, no Such Thing came out of there, The Glitch Mob came out of there. Um, I did uh, Thundercat. Um, Uh, yeah. Yeah. Deeds? Deeds? Wait, Deeds, right? Is that what you guys 
Yes, he did. <laughs> yes, he did come out in there too. Um, I mean, anyone that came out on Alpha Pub or on uh, Great Peter or like Stone 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 guys like John Wayne, Sam I Am. Um, and we've had like Bone Theory has had a lot of special guests come by. So like Tom York is definitely DJ DJ there a lot. James Blake, Erica Badu. Um, usually without notice, they don't get paid. They just want to go and play for an audience that just goes to a weekly love and community that they hear. It's a really special place. It's definitely grown. It's, a, it's um, way more popular than it's ever been. So it's a little different now. It looks like it's international now. Um, I guess they're yeah. playing in Japan and San Francisco. Yeah. Well, I mean, I don't know if they've been doing that lately, but they used to have like a quarterly or yearly thing in Japan. Like I've gone to Japan with the one there before as well, and I've been to SF also with them, but that was that was several years ago. But I think they still go. I mean, sometimes they go to New York as well. So, um, were there labels hanging out there trying to sign you guys, or how did the business part come about? The labels started there. I guess, I mean, Alpha Pup is a label owned by Daddy Kev, who's the guy who basically owns slash started Voluntary, so he was around. Um, Fly Lotus started his label, Brain Feeder, with Gas on Killer, who's another guy that came out of Voluntary. Um, so, Gas on Killer. And yeah, and Flylo kind of started that label. And yeah, I don't know. No one was out there trying to sign it. It was just a group of friends. And the ones that had the ability to, to have a label to, you know, spread the music, they did so. So did they spread it through like a pressing like vinyl or was it, were they just um, digital, online type of things? Um, in the early days, I think there was more physical products. There was like vinyl, I think so they, they would be but no, I think most people just do vinyl and digital. Um, I mean, most people listen to music off of stream because they're listening to anyone nowadays. Um, SoundCloud. Yeah, yeah, SoundCloud, Spotify. Um, I guess Apple Music. <laughs> but um, yeah, and also, you know, I have, like, I started my single as well now. So I know such thing has a no label. So everybody started really. Yeah, it's, it, there was not a strong, like, you know, um, variation sort of presence of labels at the moment there. It was definitely like, you know, your friends and your friends with everyone, and one would be like, oh, no, I need to put something out on my label, and you'd be like, yeah, sure, I'll do it. So that's why a lot of these guys, like, uh, Dayless, for example, who's also at, from that scene, Dayless is released on multiple labels, you know, and he has his own label as well. Um, I noticed that with, uh, with this world that I don't know, the, no one's out there trying to sign it, it was just a group of friends and the ones that had the ability to, to have a label to, you know, spread the music did so. It, so did they spread it through like a pressing like vinyl or was it, were they just um, digital, online type of things? Um, in the early days, I think there was more physical products. There was like vinyl, I think so they, they would do CDs as well and then obviously digital, but no, I think most people just do vinyl and digital. Um, I mean, most people listen to music off of streaming services anyways nowadays. Um, SoundCloud. Yeah, SoundCloud, Spotify. Um, I guess Apple Music, I don't know. <laughs> but, um, yeah, and also, you know, I have, like, I started my own label as well now, so. And no such thing has his own label. So everyone who started early at Monday basically now has their own label as well. Um, but, uh, yeah, it, it, there was not a strong, like, you know, um, voracious sort of presence of labels at Moment Theory. It was definitely like, you know, you were friends, you made friends with everyone, and one would be like, oh, do you want to just put something out on my label? And you'd be like, yeah, sure, I'll do it, you know. So that's why a lot of these guys, like uh, Daedalus, for example, who's also at, from that scene, Daedalus has released on multiple labels, you know, and he has his own label as well. Um, I noticed that with the. Uh, this world that you can be on multiple labels at once. I was going to ask you about that, mm -hmm. you know, because you do have your own label now, and I wanted to know how did you wind up with your own label after signing with the Brain Feeder and the 
ultra and had and you still maintain the relationships and instead of like moving here to here to here, to here things, you kind of are allowed to be in all different places. How does that work? Well, that's the good of being an independent artist. You know, you're not really signed. Um, I mean, I guess you could you could be signed like a one album deal with like options. And um, essentially, an option means that if they so they'll sign you for one album, that means you have to put out one album with them. If you sign this agreement, if they give you an option, that means that when this it's time for the second album, they get to choose if they really want to put out your album or not. So if they feel like they want to let you go, then you can release your second album with someone else. And if your first one was successful and you have an, you have another one lined up, then they'll they'll pick up the second option and release your second album as well. But it's actually up to the label. And usually, if they pick the second second option, they give you a bigger advance, which is the amount of money that they give you per album. So, um, is that advance pretty much just to record it, or is it like a personal advance too? I think it's everything. At least in my experience, the the advance that you can be given. <laughs> In which when you're signing to like super small labels, you don't really get like a very hefty advance. That probably be more you'd want to allocate that more towards recording and features and, and stuff like that. But if you're getting like a big advance from a bigger bigger label, that's you know you can pocket some of it or keep some of it. You can use it to better your album. I mean, the smart or as an artist, I think you should definitely think about using that money to better your album. Some people definitely just like want to pocket it and like not spend any of it on their music. So. so some people might do it like in their in their home, and uh, some people might get a, a real studio, studio yeah. and because uh, that could be expensive. Yeah, studios are for studios are expensive. <laughs> so did um, you do studio albums when you, when you were signed to any of these labels? Um, yeah, I've done well. I've done two full length albums. I'm a bedroom producer. That's just the way that I started, and I still like doing that. I mean. I'll probably go back to my hotel today and work on more music, or I would do that if I didn't leave my headphones at home. Um, but um, I, I usually work in the studio, like a nice studio from working with the vocalist, and that goes for the writing part and for the recording, so cutting the vocals and um, working with a top line writer. Um, I just think it's better for that environment. But for me, when I want to be creative and I want to be alone and just work on instrumental music and stuff, I don't mind being a little too cold. <laughs> so that's kind of when you're more the artist, like, and, and I and you do vocals. All the time. Yeah, kind of. <laughs> yeah, I'm not a very good singer, but I do find a way to make it work. And um, the people who you have top line, do you guys share the songwriting 50-50, or how do you guys divide up? Um, uh, the way that when I work with other vocalists. Um, First of all, I tend to work with vocalists who are very strong writers. Um, I think that, I'm all, and not just that, I trust in their abilities. I'm very much about respecting an artist and their craft. So if I work with another uh, songwriter like um, Anderson Pack, he's the guy who's on Willa, I didn't help at all with any of the vocals. He recorded them on his own and he sent them to me. But I did arrange them because they were like a whole, he definitely like didn't record a whole like eight bars or something. I had to be really creative. Um, and stuff. So you know, I give them all the writing credit. Um, there were there are moments like there's a track called Open Air. It's on this album that the Darium, sung by a singer named Joyce Rice. She didn't do any of the writing. I did all the writing for that and all the melodies, and she just came in and sang them. Um, in that case, it would be it would be different. But I don't remember the exact split or how we did that. Cause that's the part of the business part that I like sort of let someone else do. Yeah, that's kind of interesting because a lot of times when you have a top liner come in, they get half, yeah. and the track person picks up the other half. Oh yeah, yeah. I mean, I think that that is that is right. <coughs> in terms of like taking more than half or something. That's really generous of you. Yeah. <laughs> um, but you know, it's just like fair and equal. I mean, it could change. If I'm I'm working with other independent artists. If it's if it ever comes to a point where it's like working with someone that is really, really large, it would be different. I've definitely been in the studio with like larger artists and heard the way that they do their splits and stuff as well, and it's interesting. But yeah, there is part of that like numbers game and the negotiating that I don't like to participate in too much as an artist, um, just to protect myself. And you know, I want other artists to look at me as, as an artist, not as a shark. I'm not trying to like extort people for money. I'm not trying to like 
screw anyone over, or, like, you know, should knight anyone, or like do anything. So, um, but I think, uh, and that's why I have a manager, you know, and I have business managers, and, you know, I will micromanage, but at this point in my career, I don't micromanage anymore. If someone has to talk to a manager about splits, I let my manager just do it, who's somewhere here, but yeah. He's, he's the guy that handles all that stuff, and his, his place um, is very kind enough to be the bad guy sometimes. He's a nice bad guy. So he doesn't really matter. Or he's not a bad guy. He's very nice. Do you have a publisher that you work with at all, or um, a lawyer? Or I do have a lawyer that I work with, yeah. So that's also really important no matter what. I mean, um, I think the very first release, or one of the first releases I ever did was with this British label. And I didn't read the contract very well because I was just happy to have someone put out my music. It's a very long time ago. And that agreement was so unfair. It was like, what, what was the company? Um, I, will, I will not say because I don't think they exist anymore anyway, the label. But the label was like, a, it's like a smaller British indie label that basically put out a lot of people like me. Um, uh, some of them that went on to be even larger, but. Yeah, they don't. Does it start with a C? No. <laughs> I think there's a, there's a few, few, few they, A lot of the, um, foreign ones operate that way, and I've been seeing a lot of those kind of deals, and they're really crazy deals, and uh, they just own your rights forever. Yeah, and, yeah, but they don't give you anything. Yeah. Good luck trying to collect. It's, yeah. But, uh, yeah, my lawyer started that one out though, so it was good because they definitely did a breach of contract in regards to something. I don't remember what it was, but then failure to account pay. Yeah, failure, <laughs> failure to do anything basically. Um, so um, there's that. So it's good because I just don't like I own all my music again. Actually, most of my catalog I own. It's the other thing about being an indie artist. You know, you see the label only owns your your music for about like three years max. So three or five maybe? I don't think it's much over five. That is highly unusual and I've never heard of that before. Yeah. And it's like they're giving really really small advances for those labels that's not like you have to like owe them for a while. Unless unless it was a big advance then you could owe them for a while. So that sounds like a license then, because it's short term. It's like you're saying that you, that you give it to them for like three to five years and then it comes back to you and you yeah. want it. Yeah. So that's a license. That doesn't that's not a full on recording exclusive yeah, I mean, it's a little different than a license. They do own it during the duration of time, like the, in terms of like what that means to own the music. Because I have done things where like I put out something to Scion. Scion was like a license. And they, that was like three months they owned it and then went back to you. Scion music? Yeah, like. Um, New York one? Oh, I think it's in LA. It's like, it's kind of like how Red Bull does Red Bull music. It's like their creative side, marketing, music marketing kind of side. It was a long time ago. But yeah, it's really nice to own your own music and your own catalog and all that. So you mean your songs and your masters? Yeah, I get my masters come back to me. Yeah. All of it. That's impressive. Yeah. Who is your lawyer? <laughs> <laughs> this fellow named Brandon Dorsky, good lawyer. Um, no, but that's really, it's really standard, I think, even for me when I, um, now that I have my legal and I'm giving out contracts to other artists, which would only be the kind of uh, agreements that I would sign myself, because, come on, that would be so mean to like, give an artist something you know is unfair. Um, yeah, it's, it's pretty standard like that as well. But then, it's, I guess it changes, it can change. I can also be wrong, because I just don't like reading off, like paperwork or anything. <laughs> um, I wish I knew where Lewis was, so he'd be like, this, no, that's not right, that's not how it works. I don't know what he is. <laughs> oh, no. oh, there it is. Okay. <laughs> All right. Um, songs, you can have termination rights, and they can come back. But if it masters, a lot of times they you lose those, and you can't get them back. Because and the ones that I've seen from like this specific British company that everywhere I'm talking to lately says, right, did you see one of those deals? And they're really bad, and and uh, they're not going through. People are just not signing them. Some people have signed them. Some people were able to negotiate because they were so far into the process that they were like locked in. And so you could have some leverage to do something, but um, they seem really unfavorable.
label, but it sounds like you and your label, you're trying to be super artist friendly. Mm -hmm. And gosh, everyone's gonna hit you up. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I think, yeah, with the most, most I think indie labels are, they work like that now. I mean, that's why there's this big shift now. You know, all the <laughs> labels are not holding the market share as much as they used to. Um, like, Adele is like, I mean, I've heard that Hello song, Hello song many times, but she's on, she's on an indie label, you know, essentially. She's on a beggar's group label, I forgot which one, 4AD, XL, or something like that, but, um, or like Arcade Fire. They might be distributed, maybe, through like one of those large labels, but you know, that's, that's a major thing for all musicians right now to have that autonomy and ability to like, you know, maintain ownership, um, maintain your own schedule and stuff. I mean, though some of these bigger indie labels do function kind of like just a major label too. So. I've heard a bit of that about all sorts of levels of things. It is all across the board. And do you have a distributor that you use? Yes, I do for my label. It's mm, a new, a new endeavor that Lewis mostly. So my label is run by me and my manager Lewis. So we both have our strengths and I don't do that stuff. <laughs> so, yeah, no, I was just wondering if it was like, you know, the obvious of like, you know, Sony, the Orchard, or ADA, yeah, Orchard, yeah. Yeah. Orchard's good. Yeah. yeah. I mean, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, strengths and weaknesses. So like, these are things that I just like, I don't like reading paperwork, I don't like reading statements, I don't like reading royalty statements, so then I sent like, Certain things, like my manager will definitely take care of, my lawyer will take care of, my lawyer and my manager will take care of, or um, all accounting related, whatever stuff, business managers will take care of. And your agency, we dealt with them. Oh yeah, <laughs> yeah. They it, were really good. Yeah, by good, they mean they're pretty tough. Yes, I said it's like a fortress. It's like, it's, it's incredible how much effort they're putting into this event and this lecture. Like it was blowing my mind. It's like something's going on. Like you know, like maybe you're gonna blow out a fuse or you know something like that. But they were very protective yeah. and really careful with everything. And we're you know the state of California, but um, they were super nice. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. <laughs> <That's good. laughs> they were cool, and, uh, but they were very protective. Yeah. Yeah, and that's like the other part of being a musician too. The idea is if you want to actually tour and have an agent or have someone that takes care of like booking events and shows and stuff like that for you. A little bit of thing. So, as far as like um, artists who want to be on your label, do you pretty much just have in your mind who you want to sign or do you ever take submissions? Um, my label just started last year and I started my label with my own release first just to set the tone. And since then, the artists that I'm going to release or have have just released are artists that I always think deserved <coughs> deserve to be to have um, like a, some kind of deal or some label or some art uh, some piece of music come out. Um, Young Art, my label, is meant to be a platform for me to raise up other artists that just no one have, has noticed. You know, um, essentially when I did the song Rilla with Anderson Pack, he was a guy that had been in LA for a while. He's super talented and you know we just like sort of stayed at this sort of le certain level and i knew how great he was he, i mean he knows how great he is as well you know but we did this on Rilla. it was the best i mean uh, it, i mean it's like one of the it is like the strongest track on this album and beautiful and it showcases how amazing he is as a vocalist and since then now he's like gonna be on like three of the games and, on three tracks on the game's new album. He's all over Dr. Dre's album. He's like working with Kendrick Lamar. He has like tracks with Schoolboy Q. He's, that all happened since this album. Whoa, sorry. <laughs> since that album came out. Um, and, you know, uh, I'm, not, I'm, I'm not responsible for that. I'm sure this it was a chance occurred to him since his time to shine. But, you know, I would like that to happen to more artists that I release. You know, where it's like, you know, I put some put something out with them and maybe we catch the ear of one person that can really push them to that next level. Yeah, you help launch him, it sounds like. And, I mean, I don't want to take that kind of credit because I feel like it could just be chance occurrences, but you know, I think Rilla was definitely the first step in him becoming like this dude that hangs out with Dr. Dre all the time. <laughs> I was hanging out with him one day and he didn't have his wallet. 
And he's like, I don't know where it is. And then he calls me later and he's like, I know where it is. I left it on top of a snare drum at Dr. Dre's studio. And I was like, all right, cool. <laughs> And it's really cool to see that happen, like to your peers or to your friends, or um, I'm sure like the people that are around me too, to see that happen, to see me be raised up or whatever, it's really special. Or if like, you know, in the future, I see one of you guys become like the next, I don't want to make, I don't know who named Blowfish, I'm just going to like, some, someone made it, I mean, that was a bad example. <laughs> I wanted to do something like completely unrelated to this, that was a bad, really bad joke. Um, <laughs> I really like that Rilla song, and I listened to it like four or five times last night. This is really good. It's awesome. See, I'm, I'm proud of myself. <laughs> so it sounds like you have a real ear for, like, in, as an A and R person too. You're an entrepreneur, and so you might have an empire at some point. You could be one of the top labels. I mean, uh, uh, I mean maybe. Um, it's just funny when you say empire. Are you guys have seen that show Empire? Yeah. Uh, yeah, I, I don't want to be that kind of empire, but then yeah, maybe, maybe um, an ethical one. Yeah, an ethical one. Um, but you know, just, just I, I'm so weirdly less focused. I mean, I've heard this thing about like art and money, and uh, what this idea of like, okay, are you going to sell out? What are you going to have, have to sacrifice for the other? You know, are you going to sacrifice money to be the bigger artist or? Um, sacrifice art for more money or, you know, um, hurt an artist to gain more money or, you know, all these things, invest in an artist to gain less money. It's a really fine line, so I think the idea of being ethical, it's really up to the person and what you choose to do and um, what level of success you want and how you want to get there. And for me, I'm definitely, I should try to stay really grounded about where I want to go uh, with my career and my label and, um, yeah, I don't know. Maybe one day I'll be like up here interviewing some other person as well. Maybe go take that role as well, just like educating others. Um, but I don't know. Okay, cool. That was kind of ramble. Yeah, no, that's cool. I mean, and I'm glad you brought that up about the idea of you educating others because there's some things going on like um, the, the uh, Fair Pay for Fair Play Act, the Songwriters the Equity Act, and there's some. Um, a guy named Blake Morgan who kind of launched it. I don't know if you know who he is. He was the guy who had that correspondence with Pandora and they were trying to trick him into signing up and they said, oh, you'll make so much more money, but more money if you sign this. And he said, no, basically, well, I'll make 85% less money by trying to, you know, by agreeing with what you're saying. And so he published the correspondence and it was a big expose and it made Pandora back off because they were trying to get the government to change the laws so that they would pay less to artists. And uh, anyway, um, he kind of has been a hero for a lot of people, and he came up with a campaign called I Respect Music, hashtag I Respect Music, the latest is one, hashtag I Respect Music, and I Vote, um, which is really important. And all these things we're saying is the, is the idea that, you know, artists should be paid. And, and you know, the artists can dictate whatever, they can do away with free if they want to, but they should have a right. And, um, it's a really important idea for people to value creativity, and not just music, but all creative. Yeah, exactly. They're innovators too. Yeah. I mean, that's such a that's such a touchy subject, right? The idea of like the Spotify and then getting like famous and whatnot. I don't want to listen to Spotify. I'm not really like, you know, like, not paying me my taxes or like whatever. I'm getting paid so little for for this. Then um, what was that thing? Title. <coughs>
buy music, you know. Um, I definitely went through a phase of buying music, like physical items, vinyl. I mean, I still buy vinyl, but like CDs, for example. I went through a big phase where I was like, I'm just going to torrent everything. Because <laughs> that's what I can do when I have super fast internet and whatever. And then now it's come, gone in this direction. That means I'm not contributing anything, you know. And then I've gone to this thing where now I'm like, you know, I pay monthly for my like premiere or premium Spotify account, or um, like I pay for, or like I need my like premiere like SoundCloud account or like Pandora account or whatever. And then now I'm contributing again. I'm paying for music again, but not like I would have before. But now like I, that's the way the music model has kind of changed and. You know, it's very rare. I mean, you guys can't buy CDs. What's a CD? I don't know. It's something I can put my coffee mug on top of. But, you know, you can buy MP3s and stuff, but, you know, how much easier is it for you to share a playlist with your friends on Spotify or whatever, Napster? I don't know. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, and I've had conversations that definitely, I'm friends with a lot of people that pulled their entire discography off of streaming sites like Spotify. Um, only to notice like a year later they slowly like put, put it back up again, you know, like they're just like, oh, Tom York said no, and then everyone like, it's like, okay, let me take my stuff off and then put it back on without anyone noticing. So, I mean, um, the thing, I, at least for me, a lot of my income comes from like touring and shows, but that's not fair for the studio artist. It's not fair for the guy who makes the great music that doesn't need to travel or doesn't want to or does it make the kind of music that warrants like touring, you know? And um, I guess for them, a lot of it, then it's royalties. Sometimes it like syncs, like, you know, if you get your, your song in like a commercial licenses and stuff like that, which is a, a big source of income for a lot of people as well. Um, but yeah, it's a very like, mer like unclear future in terms of like the music economy and how, that, how artists will get paid for their work, you know, at least in the future. But I think, yeah, people should get paid. They just don't know how it's going to work out. It is a little bit murky, but the, the Fair Play and or Fair Play and Fair Play Act it has to do with something called performance rights, public performance rights. Oh, okay. and, and I don't know if you know, but you know how, as a writer, if, if you're with some, uh, ASCAP, BMI, CSAC, you collect money from the airplay on the radio and the TV. And um, the PROs who collect this money from songwriters, they collect like billions of dollars a year for decades. And um, the people who are recording artists have never been paid for it. But whenever you hear music on the radio, no recording artist has ever been paid. And um, in, we had a presentation from some Scandinavian students and they showed us Scandinavia and the US. In Scandinavia, we pay for our performance you know, rights for the sound recording and the recording artist. U.S., you don't. And, and, and we're like, yeah, that's right, we don't pay here. And it's because of the broadcast lobby, Google, and um, a lot of powerful people. And YouTube is another one that doesn't want to pay. Um, so the people who were the webcasters, there was a law enacted that said that the people on the internet, they do have to pay the recording artist. It's not very much money. And what they're trying to say is, well, the broadcasters never had to pay. If they only pay songwriters, why should we pay at all? We don't like this law, we want it to go away. So all these decades, you know, billions and billions of dollars have gone to the songwriters, who aren't necessarily the recording artists that you hear on the radio, but, but there's no counterpart for the recording artists, and it's just a fluke in our law. It's not really a fluke, it was like, you know, people were bribed to make sure that, you know, the law for copyright and recording artists wasn't fair uh, because there's an interest in the broadcasters not having to pay for the master. Now, when you think about it, you listen to the radio, you're listening to recording artists, and someone paid money to make those recordings, and how is it that these recording artists have never been paid? It's wrong. So that's what this fight is. Oh, okay. yeah, yeah, so it doesn't harm anybody but the artists. It's not anti-streaming, it's not anti-piracy even, except for the pirates that, like, you know, Google. You too. But uh, it's, it's an important act and it's cool to be aware of it. Okay, yeah. I feel like I've heard about, I've heard about this a bit. I've definitely heard about like this whole, I guess, that area. Definitely trying to like have 
have people paid off their SoundCloud streams with like, <coughs> some things like point zero 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 five. Yeah, that's a whole other story. Yeah, they yeah, paid very little. Yeah. It's not cool. Yeah. Um, and uh, people are working to change the law. Let's well, see if we have any more questions. I think I'm out of time. I think I got the thing that. Did I get one of those? Yes. I did. Okay. All right, so now is the turn of our audience to get some questions in. Um, and I think they're lining up over here. <coughs> Who is first online? Do we have some people? It looks like Alex Rett's over there. Alex, he's a really good musician. Oh, cool. question. Oh, yeah. Hi. Hi. So, um, I watched another one of your interviews online, and uh, you said you use Musty Ableton. Yes. And uh, I like, just got it, and I'm obsessed. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to ask you, when you play live, um, how much do you have planned? Are there parts that are completely freeform? Do you kind of know where you're going to start and end? Like, you, like if, you, if you're a magician, you don't want to share your, your tricks, I understand. Oh, yeah. you know, I, like, share, I can share every option, sure whatever. <laughs> I definitely don't try to avoid information. Um, <coughs> So with my live set, it, so it is Ableton. What I do is I have, um, it's the most chaotic looking like Ableton like, set ever. It's obviously I'm on the porn slide and um, I basically have a skeleton. So the songs that I know I always will play, you know, the songs in line that I know I, I yeah, I just, I, I'm going to play them in my tracks. And then I kind of have like this mood with the other tracks um, that I may or may not play that are more free form. Um, so, I could go, I could, and that's what's going to differentiate one show from another show versus it being just like a stamp, like all my shows are exactly the same. If you were to come to see me two nights in a row, it won't be the same set. But then there will be certain songs that will still be the same, because those are the ones that I, I know I would play, because it's just, uh, they're just my staples. And then, not just that, um, it's also how each song is broken down. And so definitely if I have songs broken down by in stem, like if I have like drums, bass, melody, um, I try not to overcomplicate it, you know, um, just because the set's already gonna be like pretty, um, I mean, you're performing live, so you wanna be engaging, and if I'm like focusing so much on my set, then I'll be really, really boring for that, because I just have a laptop and a controller in front of me anyways. Um, that is also something that changes from set to set as well. So sometimes it's like stems broken up into, songs broken up into stems that then go into maybe tracks that are fully, that are just like full tracks. So it's like a weird mixture of like live, like conducting a, it's more like conducting a symphony and then sometimes putting in like a full track, like a symphony slash of, I don't know, like a CD player or something. <laughs> This one's gonna like hit hard, so I need to give the audience like X amount of it, like the way they expect. Yeah. Like, have you ever done a show where it's just like you just know, you just you just go like open up, just start, no plan at all? Um, because I use Ableton, you know, all all the clips have to be warped and brought in anyways, so they're just like in there, and I have it all kind of going according to BPM. So if I want to, I can start anywhere I like, but. You, when you start playing a lot, you know the transitions you like to do, how you want to mix certain tracks with the other tracks. Um, the way I perform is sort of a mixture of like live composition and sort of DJing, which is a joy of using Ableton, because you can't really do that. You can have tracks separated, and you can just have a track in there, and then DJ in. So I definitely try to do like really interesting mixes, and that's something you can do in Ableton. Because technically, you can have like an infinite amount of decks. And so, yeah, that's the way that I do it. Right. Hello, I'm Tosie Thompson. Hi. I'm Kelsey. I want to thank you so much for coming. Um, my class, Order Productions, we are so stoked that you're here. So, really appreciate it. Um, I'm a huge Brain Feeder fan. Um, I just saw Flying Lotus and Thundercat in London in May, last uh, few months ago. So awesome. But um, I was just wondering, um, what was it like first meeting Flying Lotus, and um, like, how did you get in contact with, with them, and what is it like working with them? Um, but I guess um, I met Flying Lotus through this guy named Ross G, who's also on the oh, yeah, yeah. So, um, <laughs> yeah. Ross G, I met at Project Globe, and when I started going to Lone Theory one day, Ross G was like, oh, I want you to meet this guy. 
or I want you to meet Flying Lotus. And that's when Flying Lotus had released 1983, but not Los Angeles yet. So it was like, he was still like the guy about town in LA. Yeah. But you know, he's definitely way more massive now. But um, yeah, and then we just we became friends, and then we, like I uh, shared tracks with them. That's how we all worked. Then we'd all like share tracks together, or like someone would have a boombox, and we like bring a CD and like play it in the parking lot. Um, but yeah, he's he's a very brilliant person. Um, very humble too. Yeah, he's he's humble. Um, he's incredibly intelligent. You know, um, it's. Like he always has the best music videos, and I think it's really like, great aesthetic because he also did the film. And yeah, he's a good dude, good friend. And then I, I don't know what else to say. I guess we're like me, my interactions with him were definitely on a peer-to-peer -peer level. Like I never met him, and was like, oh my god, I feel like I'm meeting um, a god. Like, a god. <laughs> 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 a god. Uh, did you say god? Oh man, I'm gonna text him after. Now I don't really react as much because I know 
I know what I do is authentic. If I, I, if I have my laptop here, I'll show you guys full sessions. I'll show you everything that I do. I have definitely done things like that in the past where I show people like how I produce my tracks, all the tracks, anything you want to know VST I used, I'll let you know. Like, I'm not someone that, again, like hoards information. And I think by being a female and being transparent, that has also made it easier for me. But yeah, you know, there's always, I'm self-conscious and it's definitely something that I'm concerned about that, you know, some people might only like my music or like me as an artist because they're like, oh, you know, she's she's like a cute Hawaii female chick, you know, or, or whatever, you know, but I can't help that. I can't help if people are gonna think that. So if they're gonna listen to my music and enjoy the music, then that's fine. You'll always have that person that'll be like, oh, I didn't even know that you were a woman. And that's always like kind of nice. But at the same time, it's not, ideal because why should it be surprising that I'm a woman and I made this pop kind of music? Um, um. Yeah. <laughs> I think ideally in the future, the sign that we've really like even things out is that I won't be asked this question anymore. I shouldn't have to be asked what it's like to be a female in a male dominated industry. If in the future it won't be like that, it'll be like many females or it won't matter or, or yeah, it's, issues are pontificated by the fact that they have to be pointed out as issues, you know? So, um, it's not, it hasn't been easy, but, you know, I just maintain my integrity and move forward, and I think it's been pretty breezy. Thank you. Woo! That's awesome. That's awesome. <laughs> Hi, I'm Kelly. I'm a music industry major, and I work at KPSC Radio. <laughs> So you mentioned a few times already tonight that you recently started your own label, Young Art Records, um, and I was just wondering what were some of the struggles that you went through setting that up, and maybe what are some of the goals that you have for the label? Um, um, well, it's an ongoing process. It's a learning experience. Um, the label is up and running, which is nice. I think a lot of it, uh, the, oh, a lot of my, I don't wanna say success, but uh, I think What's helping me a lot as someone that's, I guess, running a business is learning when to um, hand things off to other people. <coughs> and that way I can focus on other things and expanding. So I don't really know how to run a label. I know how to be on a label. And um, we, me and my manager hired a label manager who actually knows how to run a label, help run a label with us. I wouldn't, I wouldn't say for, but. Now I have someone there that's able to check up on artists, check on, on remixes that we need done for certain artists or agreements that need to be set out, sent out, sorry. Um, it's not super easy, but he helped us get our distribution deal and all these things and, you know, it's an investment because if I wanted to, I could have just done everything myself, but, you know, I just wouldn't know where to start and I think, you know, investing in, like, essentially paying someone else to do it, do that part of it because they're knowledgeable um, was one of the best decisions. <coughs> it's an investment, but it's an investment that will grow into something much better. And um, I forgot <coughs> the rest of your question. <laughs> okay, what are some of the goals that you have? Goals. Um, this morning, I was in the studio with Kelly Rowland for a while, but then, you know, I'm still waiting for that to come, to turn into something, you know. Um, but I do have a track coming out with Johnny uh, Pierce for the drums, and that's pretty, I like the drums a lot, so that's pretty neat for me. And yeah, someone else, but I can't say, because we're still waiting on a track back from him. It's been like a month or something. <laughs> the Louis wants to make a phone call. <laughs> Ask Josh. Like, well, there's someone else that's super cool, but then when it comes out, he does well now. So yeah, but there's definitely more things coming up. Thank you for your time, I really yeah. appreciate this. Oh, thank you. You're welcome. Right. Uh, what's up? Uh, thank you for coming out. Uh, my question is, my question is, uh, what got you into making beats? And when you started, um, like how much of it was figuring stuff out on your own? And how much like of it was mentoring? How, like how much is it? Is like, did you have a mentor? Oh, basically, mentor. Okay. Like that showed them some um, jobs. Yeah. So for, uh, when I started, um, it was well. Okay. When I was in high school, I tried, I downloaded Reason and I opened it and I was like, 
screw this, this is, I'm not, no way. <laughs> I was like, I don't understand any of this right now. So um, that wasn't happening. So I definitely wanted to make music earlier than that, or earlier than when I actually started. Uh, freshman year, our first year of college, a friend of mine showed me Pretty Loops, and I was like, this I can do. This is like, this is definitely a little more approachable. Um, so then, he wasn't very well versed in it either, so he taught me some very, very loose, loose, like, you know, how to, like, program drums, like, where the mixer is and stuff. And then I got, I kind of did this, like, full, and full, and this, like, went full into it. Um, definitely, for me, I did, I like teaching myself a lot, so with Elbow Studio, or like specifically with Ableton, because that's what I use now anyways, I went and watched every single Ableton tutorial that Ableton provided. And then, um, yeah, homies that definitely share a lot of information. Well, especially in LA with a lot of producers, you know, there's like, you know, people will be like, this is how I compress my drums, someone else will be like, this is how I compress my drums, and everyone likes sharing information. So, um, as far as a mentor, not really. I don't think I had a mentor, like someone that really sh showed me the ropes. I definitely figured out most of it on my own. And um, I'm constantly learning. There's always new things coming out, and then I'm always teaching myself those. Um, but yeah, that's the way I did it. But then you could have someone that teaches you more. You can take classes, you know, whatever works for you as an individual. Cool, thank you. So, uh, unfortunately, this is the last question, um, but I'm Ben Jones. Uh, <laughs> uh, so, when you said that you, when do you think you really started applying yourself uh, to music? Did you decide that that's what you wanted to do? And how long after that did you really start finding success and supporting yourself with that? Yeah, that's actually a really good, um, I guess, anecdote that I can share with you guys. Um, so, music, with me, like doing music was never uh, plausible, or nothing I thought that was plausible, like I never thought I could do music and survive off of it, um, not, especially not from like an artist, like being an art, as being an artist. So when I graduated from college, I was working in video games, which was really fun, um, on, for a publisher, and I was working in business development and licensing. And then I got laid off. <coughs> and then I worked in advertising for like a year. Mind you, this isn't high level advertising jobs or like whatever. I was definitely like just graduated level jobs. Um, I was working in advertising and then got laid off from that after like a year or, so, or a few months or something as well. Um, this is like sort of when the economy was like kind of crashing. And from that point, I had already been working on music all throughout college. Um, at, even by then, you know, it was. Like, I was having my music played on KCRW, on like BBC, on uh, like Radio 1, like in France, in Japan, and everything like that. And there was like definitely inquiry to go and play shows and to tour. So what I decided to do is, instead of applying for another job and getting laid off again, I decided to take one year to focus completely on my music. Take one year off to completely focus on my music career. And, you know, I had, you know, like I had money saved up and stuff, so I was like, cool, I can do this. I live at home for a year, which is enough motivation to try to succeed. So that I'm done. <laughs> um, and what I did was, the year that I took off, um, within that, the first few months of doing that, I set up my own tour to Europe. And I took, I, like, I booked my own shows and took myself out to Europe by myself for the first time ever with people that, I had maybe just like talk, like radio hosts or um, other influencers that have just talked over the internet with, and since then, you know, it's every like that one bold move has basically changed everything. And so now it's like you know, soon after that, I had I got my booking agent, same agent I'm with now, an agency. Um, I got my manager, and yeah, it's just been like uphill from there. So it definitely took a leap of faith. But I almost had to be pushed into it because like, I was still trying to just like work a job and do music on the side and getting sort of, I guess, like being in the situation that I was in was enough to like finally make me, like, it like allowed me to finally like, sit down and be like, okay, maybe I can really do this music thing. A lot of things are happening a lot more 
things are happening for me than for other peers that are really interested in music. So I should just try it out. information on our stories, you can go to theorion.com.